So, Nancy, I understand that you had a, a wonderful cruise to Hawaii that turned into a, a shall we say, an adventure. What, what was, what was uh, the story? Well, it really was. It was a, a nice winter getaway and um, decided just to get some sunshine and enjoy the beautiful islands. And we did that. The trip over was very nice. Every day was beautiful. The seas were calm. And then when we did get to Hawaii, we had so much fun. We had um, several excursions. So like um, in Kauai, we went to the Grove Farm and saw how pineapples were were a farm there and the old farmhouse when this man started his uh, his business. And then um, we went to uh, Luau in Oahu and enjoyed that in the evening after having shopped all day and just kind of walked through the city. And then um, we went on a snorkel in Maui and saw lots of dolphins and whales and just totally enjoyed that. And then the last day was on the big island and we went um, to the land of the frozen fire to see all the new land that happened because of the volcano erupting. So it was just wonderful. We had fun every day and met some very nice people. And then, uh, you know, we had heard that it was bad luck to pick up any kind of uh, rock from the volcanoes because it causes bad luck. And we were, you know, joking later that uh, the surreal part of the trip might have happened because someone took some lava rock home. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, the bad luck started happening on Wednesday. Um, oh, no, I didn't put the date. Let's see. That's okay. What was Well, the it was... Uh, yeah, it was the fourth. We had a formal night, and one of the couples that we would eat with uh, didn't like formal nights, so they didn't come. And we had heard that a man had died on our ship from the voyage before ours that night. So I thought, we better exchange information now with the other couple who lives in Auburn. So we did that, and then the next day, they allowed us to be around, go around the ship, but they kept canceling things. So, like, the shows were canceled. The biggest uh, groups of people were canceled first. And then um, they did get on the intercom and said, lunch is your last time you can be out, that we have to quarantine after lunch. Did they say why? So, yeah, they did, because there was some sickness on board, and they didn't know, you know, they didn't have a way to test to find out what it was. But they wanted to be, um, he always, the captain always said, you know, in the utmost amount of caution that um, this is what we have to do. And he wanted us safe and secure. He used to say that all the time in his daily talks to us. But um, so after, well, lunch was really crazy, too, because people already started hoarding. You should have seen the plates leaving the dining room that day and people taking food. And so I was like, whoa, this is getting crazy. So um, March 6th, we had gotten, we had to skip our last um, port. We were supposed to go to Mexico and um, we had someone sick on board too. So they needed to get this person off. So we skipped the Mexican port. And we headed towards San Francisco. And turns out that they didn't want us. Governor, Governor Newsom said, no, nope, we don't want them. And uh, the president said his numbers would go up if we ended up getting off in San Francisco, which is where the trip originated and was supposed to uh, disembark. So we just went in circles for like three days and not knowing what was going to happen to us. And um, they were bringing our meals to our door. And we had heard that there were quite a few people that were sick from the crew. So I think in their effort to keep us safe, they would like knock at the door, put the food down, and then run away. We're circling around and uh, what was the reaction of the politicians? They didn't want the um, chance of the people on the ship 
uh, being uh, able to spread this coronavirus amongst the 50 states. I mean, we had people from foreign countries. We had people from all over the United States and quite a few from California. There were about a thousand of us. How many total on the ship? Um, there was about 2,500. Wow. I'm just rounding it off. Yeah. So it, it, you know, there was a lot of confusion and the captain would make some decisions and he was overruled and things would change. So um, what we heard is that they were going to quarantine us and then test us to see who had it. And uh, they did test while we were on the ship, uh, the people that were sick, they tested maybe around 50 people. So people that had complaint of sickness and then those that were in bed with being sick. And it turns out there were 19 crew and two passengers who were infected with coronavirus. So when did um, you find that out, though? Uh, we it took a while because they couldn't get the test kits to us. It took a couple of days. That's why I think we were circling too because they didn't know what they were dealing with and they were afraid. So um, it was a lot of coordination that took place for them to get us off the ship in Oakland. So Oakland accepted us. And then from there, we just had to wait patiently. So we were docked and took us three days to get off. because so they was, took you had three days circling around and then three days docked. Mm -hmm. And did you have plenty of food so there wasn't a problem with getting enough food to eat? And how did you cope with being isolated? Well, there was plenty of food. Um, you know, we even had choices in the beginning. They said appetizer or dessert and, along with an entree. And they were, you know, being really amazing, I thought, for what was happening. But it was the end of our cruise, and they started running out of food. So then we noticed we were getting some canned, um, like, Italian food and... Um, we had this ham, I think it was canned ham, and they had fried it, and it was a little bit like shoe leather. <laughs> so they were getting into the last of the, the food that they had available. So, um, But once we got to Oakland, they had someone on shore that um, was making food for us, and it got a, a lot better. There wasn't any choices at that point, but it was fine. You know, We were happy to be fed. So you had... And how many, eight days or something of being confined to your room overall? Six. And, Six. and then how did you, did you have a room with a window that you could look out the window and have a balcony or? Yeah, I didn't have a balcony, but we had a window and it was an obstructed view. But luckily we could see a lot of what was going on. We could see the helicopters coming, dropping the test kits off. And the personnel, they actually dropped personnel off to check, um, you know, to ask us questions and to see how the, the passengers were doing and to try to figure out how to get us all off. So they decided to take the sick people off first and they were taken to hospitals or whatever was required. I mean, if they didn't have as bad as symptoms, I'm sure they just quarantined them. And then um, they were going to take all of the Californians off next. And there was two bases willing to take us. And uh, Travis was going to be from Northern California. And then Miramar for Southern Californians. And so they wanted to get all the Californians off. But in the meantime, there was a lot of countries that wanted their citizens home. So they chartered airplanes Canada and um, Great and um, Britain sent for airplanes. So then the the whole mix of what they were going to do changed. So a plane would arrive, and then they'd call the people that would would leave on those planes. So um, we ended up being on for three days, and a lot of Californians had left, and we heard that Travis was filling up, and they had taken our luggage the night before we got off. And um, so when we finally were able to disembark, um, they took our temperature and they asked us a couple of questions and then put us on a bus that said, oh, you're going to Miramar and you're the third group. 
So we thought we were driving. We asked, and they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go to Miramar. And so we drove a ways, and then they turned into Oakland Airport. So then we're all going, well, I guess we're going to fly. So it was really unusual. They took us to the back gate. And um, they had this plane that um, my friend called a CIA plane. <laughs> and um, they told us that we couldn't use the bathroom, that the bathrooms weren't working. And they were uh, on, at the airport on the tarmac. They had these um, uh, port potties And there were three busloads of us. So we each took turns. We went to the bathroom. And they said... You better go now because there won't be a bathroom for hours. Well, you know how many hours it was for us? No. Eight. Oh. Eight hours. You can't drink we anything then. No, they gave us a lunch with two, like a bottle of water and soda. And when I heard that, I thought, I can't drink anything. And so I didn't. And um, it was nine o'clock at night before we were able to get to a bathroom. Wow. So that was really hard. But um, anyway, it all seemed so surreal, like getting on this airplane that was really old with these old leather seats, and they were pushed really close together. So we had a hard time even getting our carry-ons under the seat. And the friend I was traveling with sat on his lunch because he couldn't quite maneuver everything. And um, so it was really crunched and very uncomfortable. So we sat on the bus for a long time before they uh, boarded us on the plane. And then they boarded us and we sat. And there was the engine was not on. So it got really hot and stuffy. And um, a lot of us were feeling ill. Like, quite like, can we get this show on the road? But it took time. And then we ended up with too much fuel. So they did run the airplane and they had to get rid of some of the fuel. And so um, we left. Uh, the, the ship at around 10.30 in the morning and um, we got to uh, Miramar we landed on on the base and um, it took another uh, it was it was at dusk and we saw a beautiful sunset while we were sitting on the bus but then we would only take one bus load of us at a time because they didn't want a bunch of us together, although we had been together <laughs> on the bus and on the plane with our masks on. And um, so by the time we got to uh, our inn, it was 9 o'clock at night. And then uh, because I was traveling with just a friend, uh, they had given us a room with just one double bed, and I said, that's not suitable so um, we asked that they, you know, either roll a bed in or, you know, give us another another bed. And they weren't taking us too seriously. So we stayed down in the lobby and I just walk, walk, walk because I finally had some room to do that because we had been in our small cabins where I did walk in there and dance and try to keep busy and get my exercise in. But, um, yeah, we... Say say a, say a word about that. What what else did you do when you were at sea to keep your sanity? Um, did you you have t you had, must have televisions in the room? Um, yeah, we had televisions so we could watch. Um, they had some of the main uh, news stations, so we were watching the news about our ship <laughs> and uh, realized that it was it was international news that. Uh, we were in this, this dilemma. And uh, so we did that. And then um, Princess was so great. They sent like Sudoku and coloring books, um, all kinds of things. Oh, a jewelry kit. All to kinds make, of things. To make jewelry? Uh, yeah, I didn't do it, though, because um, I was too interested in watching the, the news and doing my exercising. So I would turn on salsa music and salsa and... You know, just trying to get my exercise in. So um, I thought, I brought the jewelry kit home. I'll make it someday. <laughs> but, um, you know, Princess every day sent us a packet of activities. Nice. While we were, yeah, while we were on the ship. And then, um, so when we got to Miramar, um, 
we got our rooms at one o'clock in the morning, and I think I didn't get to bed at like till two thirty that morning. And uh, it took a couple of days of adjusting. Uh, we never got enough sleep. I'm a night owl, and I'm up at night. And they would knock at our doors to bring breakfast, so we'd hear bam, bam, bam. And uh, so I'd get up and get the breakfast and throw it on the table and go back to bed. And, um, you know, then, you know, it, they just kept bamming on our doors, you know, for the garbage and to come and take our temperature. They did our temperature twice a day. And, um, and then the day after we got there, uh, we had our first test um, for the coronavirus. And then we didn't hear anything. And um, I, I don't know, days later, they did a second test. So we actually had two tests. Here there aren't tests to go around here for people that are sick, and we were mostly well. We did hear about 30 passengers tested positive, and not just from our place, but from the four bases that took people from the ship. So um, it wasn't as widespread as I thought it was going to be. But we had a, a group at, our, at Miramar, that had all sat together, there were eight of them, and their waiter had got it, gotten ill. So a different person came in, they were asking about him, like, where is he? And they said, well, he's sick, it turns out he had coronavirus. And this is how quickly it can pass from one person to the other. Six of the eight people at that table had it. Wow. But they didn't stay, they didn't keep them at Miramar, they were sent other places, depending on the condition that they were in. So I felt pretty safe there, actually. The food the first week was terrible, and people complained, and they found uh, a different source for the food, so it got better. And my friend Michael and I liked it so much that uh, we went down and asked if we could stay an extra week <laughs> because the food had gotten so good, and we were down in San Diego, and the weather was supposed to be getting better because it rained quite a bit when we were there. But uh, so they got a good laugh out of that. But um, we ended up leaving on um, March 25th. And we had left uh, San Francisco for the beginning of the cruise on February 21st. So it was supposed to be a 15 day uh, vacation. And it turned in. We, so we got two weeks, we paid for two weeks and got three weeks for free. <laughs> My goodness. Um, yeah. So it, you know, the whole thing did seem very surreal. I mean, just being on the base was incredible, like the flying machines that they had. And, um, you know, normally you don't get to go on a base like that and see the technology and the, the kinds of things that are going on. And um, so every day was like an air show, too. I would walk outside. They had um, put a big fence around our living uh, structures so we couldn't go outside of that and there was always a guard at the the front of it and um but you know we had this wonderful air show every day these air, they'd see like three planes and two of them would peel off you know from each other and so it was like an air show every day how did so, you get back from san diego to chico and where was your vehicle how did you get originally to san francisco well, we drove from Chico to San Francisco, and they have a parking garage that's right uh, close to where you embark. So uh, we had to get back to San Francisco. So Princess is the one that figured out how to get us all home. And, you know, they were still sending. We had people from Alaska still and Hawaii. And all the other states left one by one. Because we ended up with a lot of different states because Texas wouldn't take them. Texas would only take their own citizens. And then the rest of the country were supposed to go to Texas. And when Texas said, no, nope, we don't want them, then they sent them, Miramar accepted them. So we had Oregon and Washington and Idaho, Colorado. And one by one, all those states left. So it was like the, at the end... Just uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and California. And um, so they made arrangements for us. They put us on um, uh, not American, United Airlines. And 
it was very, very few passengers. I couldn't believe, I mean, I, I was so worried about, you know, being around people again, and because we did the social distancing, we always wore a mask. We had to answer the door with our masks on. So, you know, to be back out in the public again was kind of scary for us, but it was mostly passengers from the ship that were on that plane. So that was really reassuring. And then um, we took a taxi from the airport to the parking structure. And then um, we had a hard time getting our car out. There was no one there, it was, you know, around six o'clock. And so we were walking around there. And of course we have our own luggage. And because I didn't have to take the plane, I had a very large suitcase. So we finally got a hold, we had some numbers we could call. And they told us where to go. And um, I had to get my big old suitcase down these stairs. <laughs> so that was like really kind of scary. I was kind of nervous in there like, are we gonna be able to drive out of here? So um, finally they just automatically uh, lifted the, uh, the barrier and we were able to drive home. And we got home around nine o'clock that night. Wow. So, so yeah. overall, it sounds like the the ship captain and the administration of, of the ship and the Princess Lines were were effective, and the hang-up was in the the government response of not wanting to find a place. Yeah, and um, I have to say the ship did everything in their power to make us comfortable, and they even like um, they gave us um, that trip for free. And they didn't charge us anything. Like, we had bought those excursions for those four ports we went into. And it came to, like, $500. And um, they forgave everything. Even things we had bought aboard. Like, I bought a couple of dresses and um, a little purse. Everything was, was taken off our bill. Mm. And they gave us another free cruise that... Um, well, we'll see what happens with this coronavirus, but, you know, that has to be booked by March of 21 because they don't want to lose us as customers. And, you know, they they were really amazing. They, they tried their best to make us happy, keep us safe, uh, and that captain was unbelievable. I mean, I I really appreciated him. Mm. And yeah. if, if you'd been... Um the U.S. government, what would you have done differently? Um, I would have tried to coordinate it better. I mean, it just seemed like it was so chaotic. And nobody could make a decision. That's why we were out there. I have a picture of our route. It's like a kid scribbled these crazy circles going around the Pacific Ocean. And, um, you know, but I also think that, you know, when has this happened? You know, I mean, it was all new and what they were going to do with us. And so, you know, we just have to be patient. That's how I felt. And mm. I kept calm that way. Like, I, this is not in my hands. Mm. And the only thing I can do is to be patient and hopefully get home eventually like we did. Mm -hmm. So, And wh yeah. what did you notice from the other people on the ship? You were isolated, but in Miramar, you probably talked to other people. Were they freaking out and anxious, or were they like calm, cool, and collected, or how did people handle being quarantined? You know, um, most people were very good. There was a couple of complainers, and there's always a couple of complainers, and you know, um, I don't think that did, did them any good. I think it hurt them to react that way. But uh, there were some people that didn't come out of their rooms. And uh, we were out and about and doing the pers you know, personal distancing and wearing our masks. But, you know, we tried to make the best of it. And um, uh, actually, we, we, Michael and I were the cheering section. And uh, he wore his lay wherever we went. And so everyone knew Michael. And um, so when people were coming after us, and we were up till 1 o'clock in the morning when we had gotten there on that day. Um, he was greeting everybody oh. at the door with aloha <laughs> and uh, being very sociable. And, you know, um, when the, we, our luggage went to Travis, the luggage, oh, that was a huge mess because the government or the CDC was handling the luggage. 
And we had luggage from Texas and Georgia, and the people weren't there. So these, the luggage just sat in the lobby for days. And we finally said, you have to do something for that, with that. And we called Princess, and um, Princess got on it. And the next day, that stuff was gone. Um, we didn't have our luggage. It was in Travis. And uh, we had friends that were sitting at our table. And they found it and took a picture of it and sent it to us. And so, um, you know, it sat there for, for days as well. So we didn't even have any clothes for five days. <laughs> Did you have like a toothbrush or nothing? Well, we took, you know, the overnight bag. And they told us to take enough for 24 hours, but it certainly was very much. So I just wore the same thing every day. It was really easy to pick you know, <laughs> what I was going to wear. <laughs> My goodness. So, so if, if there was anything that you could do over again or have someone else do over again, would there be anything that you think should be have done been done differently? Well, I think that in the age of travel and how close all the continents are because of travel, that these kinds of things should be thought out beforehand. And I think this was the very first time that they had to deal with uh, the, the uh, immense situation that happened because of coronavirus. So I think that we need to be more prepared. What you and, said that, that someone died on the the cruise before yours on the Princess. Do you know what they died of? He died of coronavirus. He was the first Californian uh, that died of the coronavirus. He went on the cruise before ours to Mexico, and he got off and he was ill, and he went home to Placer County and got very, very sick and died. And so, um, yeah, that was the first California death. So that, you know, that was really right at the beginning of all of this coming to America. That's why it was so surreal. And, you know, like, what is going to happen? I mean, we, we were all like, wow, like, this is very strange and surreal. But do you but, think that that, that person with the virus had anything to do with your cruise being infected? Well, there were, um, I, I can't remember exactly how many, maybe 50 people that went from that cruise to our cruise. Oh. And, you know, the crew dealt with uh, the people on that cruise. That's why 19 of the 21 that were originally uh, diagnosed, uh, that's why that happened, because of the... It, actually started on the cruise before ours. Had I known that, I would have gone, but we didn't know. So uh, it became quite the adventure, and I'm really happy to be back home. I bet you it. are. Yeah. yeah. Did, I, I would imagine that it makes you appreciate things that we usually take for granted, like our yard and being able to yeah. walk down the street and that kind of thing. Yeah, and my neighbors, my neighbors were great. They were calling me, and, you know, that was another wonderful thing is to really not be alone. Like, I could talk to my children and my grandson, and um, I did have a problem with my phone on Friday the 13th. It was a very bad day. I had woken up, and my phone wouldn't work. And so that was the first day that I felt panicked. And it turns out that uh, the captain had told us once we were in our rooms to go ahead and use our phones. But they didn't explain how to do that, so I just used my phone. And it turns out I had all these roaming charges. And Verizon, when I reached $1,600, shut me off. And then Michael had a bill of $900, and his was shut off as well. But we didn't know why. So it took um, my son, who was on my plan, like a couple hours with Verizon to get them to turn it back on. So just having that phone was my lifeline through all this. And I think that kept me up mm. and doing fine. Because you didn't feel so isolated. Yeah, so I still have to deal with Verizon on the uh, charges because, you know, I didn't know. Uh, and it was extraordinary circumstances and... I, you know, even if I have to pay it, I'm okay, because that was really important for me to have that lifeline. So are you planning on taking a cruise again? Are you going to take Princess up on their offer? 
you know, I think I will. I mean, I certainly won't go on when there's a virus going around the world, but I love to be on the water and I love visiting places and it's a great way to do it. And um, I sure do appreciate all the people that made that doable for us. Mm. You know, they were, they were amazing. Great. So I, yeah. 